All right, good evening. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll begin there in just a second. We have to have our story that everybody walks out with. Stories told of a little girl. I was talking to her mother, and she said, Mama, you got gray hair. Yes, I do. Where'd that come from? Mama looked at her and said, Every time you do something bad, every time you do something that's sad, I have a hair that turns gray. The little girl thought for a minute. She looked at her mama and she said, You must have been terrible because grandmama is completely white. <laughs> So, you know, could be worse, could fall out. So, you know how that goes. Anyway, this evening we're studying, continuing our study of the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter. It gets interesting now. No, it's always been interesting. I love this book. But this is a book that deals with Jesus as much as anything, but it also deals with the Old Testament. And you can learn a lot about the Old Testament from a study of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews talks about Jesus being a better messenger, a better apostle, a better priest. He also talks about the, the, the new law being a better covenant. And there's a better sacrifice. That's Jesus. And there's a better way. We're going to talk about all of that. We're in the middle of talking about Jesus as a better priest. It begins in the fourth chapter and goes through the seventh chapter. Jesus is so important and so simple in the thinking of New Testament. And you get to the book of Hebrews, and it's somewhat refreshing because you, you do see Jesus in, in, in so many different facets in this book. Yet at the same time, too, you do get sort of, like I said, a refresher course of the Old Testament. But you have to remember the purpose for the writing of the book. The book itself is a book of encouragement. It's a book that encourages the readers to do certain things. One of the things we'll talk about tonight is it encourages them to grow, and that's important. The reason it encourages them to do that is because there were so many that wanted to go back to the old law, and there was a, a difficulty with giving up. We've talked about this, uh, this is kind of way that I introduced just the study of the book of Hebrews, that it's so difficult to give up what you've learned or known all your life. Now all of a sudden you're asked to, to, to give up the old law, the sacrifices, the priests, the priesthood, that you're, you're asked to give all of that up and all of a sudden study and, and to believe in a new way. You're wondering, is this the right way? Shouldn't we go back to the old way? Because the old way we're comfortable in. If we're comfortable in something, it's very hard to give it up, right? It's very hard to give up. Your comfort foods. You know, you go to the doctor, the doctor says you need to go on a diet. Well, that's grounds to get a new doctor, first of all. But beyond that, then what do they tell you? Well, they tell you give up, uh, give up certain foods. I was sitting with a, a preacher friend of mine Monday at the, the workshop. Comfort foods. You know, you go to the doctor, the doctor says you need to go on a diet. Well, that's grounds to get a new doctor, first of all. But beyond that, then what do they tell you? Well, they tell you give up, uh, give up certain foods. I was sitting with a, a preacher friend of mine Monday at the, the workshop. We were eating lunch, and he was sitting across from me. And Steve uh, Kirby is his name. He preaches at Hilldale Congregation in Clarksville. Steve has lost uh, approximately 50 pounds over the past almost year. Uh, he told me how he was doing it. He told me what he did. I said, it ain't worth it. <laughs> but nevertheless, he looks good, and he needed to because he was overweight and because uh, uh, he's like all preachers, he sit down way too much, and he wasn't getting up and moving, and he he's had some health issues uh, the last three years or so. And so needless to say, uh, I'm proud of Steve for losing those 50 pounds, but but, yeah, I don't know that it's worth it. But he talked about giving up certain foods, and I thought, nah. <laughs> Therein lies part of the problem, why I need to lose 10 pounds. But the book of Hebrews deals with and begins in the sixth chapter 
about the basic principles. This is probably more important than we really stop to think about it. Back in the 1980s, middle to late 80s, there was a group of preachers, group of folks, that began to say that Hebrews chapter 6, this list here that we'll talk about, that it was the definitive list for if you believed these things, then you were all right, and we could have fellowship with you, and we would say that you were all right, as long as you said we were all right. Well, first of all, there's difficulty with that principle in and of itself. Second of all, this is not a definitive list. There are things here that uh, that don't really fit in. They fit in, yes, but in a general way. And there's not a great deal of specificity to this list. But yet at the same time, too, when you think about it, there's also some things that are not in this list that need to be in this list in order just to say, okay, these are the things which we fellowship on. Now, that group that began in the 80s talking about that has gone a lot further uh, through the, the years. But this is where they began. But this list is interesting. The pr Hebrew writer talks about, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go unto perfection. Leaving the discussion of the simple things, the simple foundation, the foundation principles. We're all interested in the foundation principles, aren't we? The foundation is important. There was a man one time that was in a, a mini-story building in New York City. And he was on, I believe, according to the story that I read, he was on about the 40th floor, and he noticed a crack in the wall. And when they noticed it, they noticed it that it was quite uh, sizable and that it was also structural. It was not it, from the standpoint of looks. And so immediately this man who was a building engineer ran down to the basement of this building. And someone asked him, so why in the world did you run down to, to the basement? He says, because that's where that crack starts in many ways. The foundation has to be solid. We all need the, the fundamental foundation principles. Now, if I were to say, well, what are the basic fundamental principles? principles beyond say what's in this list if i were to say well we need to know certain things about salvation we need to know certain things about god we need to know certain things about the church we need to know certain things about uh, christian living we need to know certain things about the bible uh, do da do da do da you you could say yeah okay well that's how to, kind of the hebrew writer is talking about there were certain simple foundational principles and he says we're going, we're going to leave the discussion of these principles of Christ. And let's go on to perfection or maturity. Let's grow up a little bit. Let's go from using milk to using meat. i give you, I give you another story, prime example of this. Uh, when I graduated from Fried Hardeman University back in the 19... Well, it's really none of your business. But anyway, uh, a long time ago... <laughs> 1984, I graduated from Fried Hardman. In 1984, when I graduated from Fried Hardman, I, it was funny. It, we tell the story. I, I literally had a birthday on Friday, graduated from Fried Hardman on Saturday, and got a, a full-time preaching job on Sunday. It was a good weekend. Uh, it, it was also a good weekend because it was close enough to where we needed to be. Suzanne was technically a year behind me in school. She's younger than I am. Don't, don't remind her. But anyway, she... Uh, she was technically a year behind me, but she loved me so much <laughs> that she went to summer school. So she still had her student teaching to do. And they told us if you could get within a certain amount of miles from Fried Hardeman that you could do your student teaching, <clears throat> we got right at the limit. Lord was good. We, got on, we were able to get married that summer then, and she student taught, and, and so we lived poorly for a year. And, uh, but we made it. We did fine. Nevertheless, uh, I began, I had been at this congregation for a few months, and so I thought, you know, I need to, to grow. And so I began to, to teach and to preach on Sunday nights 
what I would consider fundamental, foundational lessons, but were on very difficult subjects. The Godhead, the Holy Spirit, indwelling the Holy Spirit, those types of things. And I remember a man that had served as an elder in that congregation, but was no longer serving because of health reasons. And I remember him coming out and he says, these things are too deep and yea, too deep for us. And I got to thinking, here's a man, and he was wonderful to me. He was a great asset to me. But I also began to think, here's a man that's been well-grounded in these things and probably should have taught me at that point those things that were true and right. Sometimes we don't grow. Sometimes it's because of lack of study. Sometimes subjects, we just avoid them. And sometimes there are dis- differences of thought and opinion. Uh, when when I was trying out for congregations in order to find congregations fit, there was a, an eldership that said, uh, I believe there, there were four elders in that congregation, and uh, one of the elders said, we believe, probably we believe alike in everything except the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, what do you believe? And he says, we don't know. <laughs> I said, well, let me come in and explain it to you. And uh, so it, that was uh, that was probably our second choice. Y'all were our first. And so, sorry. But, <laughs> but we're here. But needless to say, we need to move on. We need to grow. We need to grow. That doesn't mean that you're going to remember everything. I mean, those subjects that you don't study much, like the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, you're not going to remember all those things. I, I don't expect you to, and I don't believe the Lord expects you to. But I believe he does ask us and believe that we should continue to build upon the foundation that we've we've got. And we'll be reminded of those things. Uh, Lord willing, not this Sunday, let's see, next Sunday, week from this coming Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to preach on remember. Why? Because Memorial Day weekend. But we're going to talk about what God tells us in the Bible to remember. You see, sometimes we're going to forget. And so Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, the second epistle I write unto you, that I may stir up your minds by way of remembrance. I want to remind you of some things. So the Bible reminds us of things. Well, that's true with regards to biblical study, and that causes us to grow. And so the Hebrew writer is saying, okay, let's go into maturity. Let's grow. Okay, what are some things? He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. We understand repentance, right? What is repentance? See, I've been talking a lot. I'm ready to rest. What's repentance? Change of heart that brings about a change of action. It's the idea of turning around. It's, uh, I have one guy define it this way, a sense of sin, a sorrow for that sin, and a severance from that sin. And you can tell he was a preacher because he used alliteration. But a change. And so while Paul would remind us that godly sorrow works repentance, to salvation. He says, first of all, not laying again the foundation of repentance. We got that. But repentance from dead works, those things that are useless, those things that are sinful, those things that are wrong, and a faith towards God. We understand faith, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is, what did the Hebrew writer say? Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You ever analyzed that? Go do that. We will in a couple of weeks. But it's it's a great definition. But we, we sometimes rattle that off without thinking about what it really means. And so he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, of doctrine of baptisms. Notice that it's plural. Baptisms. Baptismos. There are more and one, oh, sorry, wrong grammar. There is more than one baptism in the New Testament. There's the baptism of John. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What else? 
Baptism of forgiveness, right? Baptism of suffering. Baptism of Moses. One more. What is it? 1 Corinthians 15, what is it? You ought to know this. You had a friend that what you had a friend you had a friend that told us we were in her vehicle, as a matter of fact, when she told us that she had done this over I forgot how many times she said twenty times. Baptism for the dead, Sherry. Baptism for the dead, Sherry Nunn. She, uh, yeah, we were right. I don't know where we were going, but it was all three of us in her vehicle, and she was driving. And uh, she came out of uh, a, a belief of faith that did this, uh, baptized for the dead. And so 1 Corinthians 15 talked about a baptism for the dead. This is believed baptism with regards to what we think of, with regards to baptism of salvation or baptism of water, Baptism of forgiveness, ever how you want to phrase it. But uh, he says, we're moving on. Then the laying on of hands. Well, guess what? In the Bible, there are more than one laying on of hands. And what does it mean? Well, you know, my mother laid hands on me several times. But <laughs> Bless her heart. Uh, and I just couldn't get it either, you know. I just, but... Uh, there's, there's several laying, hand, laying on of hands. There's, there's the laying on of hands with regards to remembering the Old Testament. Remember the, the scapegoat, Leviticus. Oh, I didn't look this up. I think it's 15, 14, 15, or 16, somewhere in there. The scapegoat. They laid the hands, thus laid sins on the, the, uh, the scapegoat or the goat and, and then sent it through the woods and it became the scapegoat, and that's where we get the term scapegoat from, actually. And uh, so, so there was that laying on of hands. There, there was the, the laying on of hands with regards to the transferring of miraculous powers in the New Testament. There was also the laying on of hands uh, in the New Testament when, say, there was commission to go, uh, a commission to do something, the laying on of hands uh, with regards to... to uh, the appointment of elders, and there's still a, a discussion over whether that should be. Of course, my question is, if it is to be, then who's to do it? And that's the question nobody can answer at all <laughs> in this day and age. Uh, there's also the idea of laying on hands with regards to encouragement that was found in Book of Acts. And so you have these things. Probably it's talking about uh, here since we're talking under New Testament, talking about the, the idea of encouraging, laying on of hands in order to encourage others. And of the resurrection of the dead, well, that's, we understand that, 1 Corinthians 15. And of eternal judgment, and I think that's pretty straightforward, the, the judgment that is to come. And this we will do if God permits. This is what we're going to do. We're going to, the Hebrew writer says, therefore, leaving the discussion of these elementary procedures, let's go on to maturity. Let's don't, we don't have to always rehash all of these things. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. The mouthful right there, right? Let's think about it. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened have you ever been enlightened? We all really have, haven't we? Somebody tells us something. They enlighten us. Teachers enlighten us. If I get with you, and whatever you have done in your lifetime as a profession, you are very knowledgeable in that. And I'm sure that I could find something wherein you would enlighten me because you would, after talking for a while, you'd finally find something that I could understand and associate with. 
and I would be enlightened by you. And so notice the Hebrew writer says, those who were once enlightened, those who once walked in the faith, those who once obeyed the gospel and have tasted of the heavenly gift. What does Romans chapter 6, verse 23 say? For the wages of sin are what? Death. But, what's the next words? The gift of God is eternal life. Well, the heavenly gift here. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've tasted of salvation. They've become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 tells us what with regards to the Holy Spirit. It's got sort of a trap question. Peter said to them, repent, be baptized to everyone of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins and what? You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll just tell you now, I'll, I'll cut to the chase real quick. I believe the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit itself. Acts chapter 5 tells us that we as Christians receive the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that it's a down payment or an earnest uh, we could go for a long time talking about all that. But needless to say, here we have these folks that have been Christians, the Hebrew writer says. They've tasted the good word of God. They've experienced, they've been nourished by the word of God. So these are folks, the Hebrew writer in this, these, couple, these three verses says, these folks that were enlightened, they were taught, they tasted the gift. They were saved. They, they walked with the Lord and they had fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And they've tasted, they've experienced, they've been nourished by the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, the powers with regards to God and the powers with regards to, to what we receive as Christians. God's providential care comes to mind, right? God's ability to watch over us and take care of us. How about God's ability to change our life, to fortify our faith, and to fortify us against Satan? Those would be some of the powers of the age to come. Verse 6, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. These folks who once were Christians, faithful Christians, we would term them, if they fall away. Now, look at the condition. It's if. Second of all, notice that they have fallen away. Is there a difference between falling and falling away? This is no, this is yes. And the answer is yes, right? There's a difference. There's a difference between falling and falling away. We all fall. We all fail. We at times we all sin. That's what sin is. Sin's missing the mark or failing, failing to hit the mark. And so we sin, we fall. But falling away is where we give up, we renounce, we turn our back on. And so the Bible teaches, I think we covered this a couple of weeks ago. In uh, Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible teaches the possibility of apostasy. The Bible teaches that one can fall from the grace of God. If you ever want to be entertained, get out some religious books of folks that do not believe in the possibility of apostasy. Turn to such sections as this in Hebrews 3, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and others, and read how they try to explain their way out of it. If you want to be amused. It's sad. It's sad that they can that a lot of these folks. I have those books in my library in the office there. Uh, they can be so straight down the line on everything, and they can get to something like this. And all of a sudden, they can't see it for what it says, but they've seen everything else for what it says. You can. The Bible teaches you can fall away. In many ways, 
what is the purpose for a big portion of the Bible? Because if you stop and think about it, what does the Bible do? It brings you to God, but what else does it do? It teaches us how to stay with God. And so to God is really all it would need to teach us if we can't fall from God, right? And so there are principles, there are passages, there are people uh, in the Bible that all teach us and show us that one can fall from the grace of God. And the Hebrew writer says, if they fall away, here's a possibility, to renew them again to repentance. Okay, here's where a lot of folks that don't believe in the possibility of apostasy, here's where they have the hang up. They will tell you, well, you folks that believe that you can, you put yourself in a position of, well, you're in Christ, and then you're not in Christ. And you're in Christ, you're not in Christ. You're in Christ, and you're not in Christ. No. Here's the difference. What's the difference? What's our favorite passage out of 1 John? Chapter 1, verse what? 7, right? If we walk in the light, season the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It tells us what? Trying to live the best life you know how. Trying to live the Christian life. Trying to do what's right. The blood of Christ keeps on cleaning us cleansing us or cleaning us from all unrighteousness. Wonderful passage. It's true. Bank on it. Hold it. Rely upon it. But if you walk away from it, if you give it up, it can't help you. Right? These folks, notice what the Hebrew writer says. These folks that he's talking about, they fall away. And then notice what it says. They crucify again for themselves the Son of God. And the idea there is they keep crucifying Him. They keep putting Him to the cross by their sins. These are folks that have not gotten out of it and evidently don't want to get out of it. For the Hebrew writer says, it's impossible. Now, here's the question. Can they? The answer is yes. Can they get out? Absolutely. Can one uh, go and, and go off, leave the Lord for a period of time, and then come back? Absolutely. I think I've shared this story with you. I won't call the man's name. He's passed away now. You probably wouldn't know him, but uh, when we were in, in Waverly, Tennessee, working with the church there in Waverly, there was a man one day that just showed up. Everybody knew him. I did not know him. I had never met him, but everybody knew him at church. For about 35 years, he hadn't been to church. But in recent weeks before his coming to a worship service, He'd been listening to the radio program. We we had a daily radio program, daily 15-minute uh, program that Lee and I uh, put out, but we also put both of our Sunday morning and Sunday night services on the radio, just like what we're doing with regards to telephone service now. And uh, he had started listening to that again, and he came back. And about two or three weeks after he started coming back, he came forward. I was wrong. I should have never walked away. For, well, until he got in health-wise where he couldn't, he was faithful to the Lord and to his duties. Anything, anything we did that he could be of service, he was right there. You can come back. You can come back home. The door is always open. The invitation's always open, as the old saying goes. The door's always open. Someone, I, I share with you a story. Steve, when Steve and I, when it snowed, Steve and I was out here. I, I was, I was not doing anything. I was, I was the boss. <laughs> Steve was doing the work. There's a lady that pulled up, and, and Steve knew her, and Steve invited her to church. She said, "Why, well, if I were to walk in that church, and she said, I need to be in there. But if I were to walk in there, sirens would go off." And I just looked at her and said, "No, I wouldn't." 
She looked at me, her eyes got big. She looked at me and I said, we don't have any. Oh, <laughs> people think that. No, no, no. You can come home. But these folks in Hebrews chapter 6 were not willing to. And they needed need to, to understand that they needed to grow. Here's their problem. Here's what they had done. They had not grown, and they had left their faith. They hadn't been challenged, and they hadn't challenged themselves. Now, isn't that sad, to say the least? You see, when we don't grow, it's really easy to give up, isn't it? When we don't grow, we can really make it impossible. We can, to, we, we claim that lukewarm spirit, and once it grabs a hold of us, it's very hard. Because let's face it, let, let's let's just be honest about this. A lot of going to church is habit. Now, let, you know, you may not like me saying that, but it's true. Weren't you real comfortable at home, listening on the telephone in pajamas, drinking a cup of coffee? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're honest. <laughs> You're honest. Absolutely. You know, it was easy. Now, there are times you can't get out. Health-wise, we understand all that. We come to worship, and worship, sadly, has become our measuring stick for faithfulness. It's part of it. It's not all of it. It's part of it. I want to be careful what I'm saying because, first of all, I don't want to make anybody mad. But second of all, I'm going to preach on some of this Sunday morning, so I want to be careful what I'm saying. I don't want to steal all my thunder for Sunday. But we need to remember that it's important that we stay in that habit because there is good that can be gained. But we need to be careful that the habit is not just that, a habit. Do you drive down the road sometimes and all of a sudden it comes to you? I don't remember if those red lights, those last three red lights were red or green or purple. You know, you just, you just zoned out for a while because you, you've been driving for longer than, than your car is old. <laughs> we do those things. And we never want worship to become tired, mundane, habit. I can tell you in the morning when I shave where I'll start. Why? Because I've done it for years. I can tell you when I get dressed in the morning... The order of clothes, how I put them on. You know why? Because if I've tried to put them on different. I challenged the congregation once to do that, and I did it. I felt naked the whole day. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that, that the habit of coming to church is not just a habit from the standpoint of, of tired, same old thing. But at the same time, too, we've got to be in the habit of doing what God tells us to do. These folks have gotten out of it. And when we get out of it, we're in danger. We're in danger of what happened to them happens to us. And think about when we give up what we do to Jesus. We put him to an open shame. We hurt Jesus. And a lot, well, not everybody, but a great number of folks that I've talked to through the years of preaching that have just become lukewarm, they didn't intend on it. They didn't mean to. It just happened slowly. And then by the time, you know, you, you catch it and they catch it, um, they've given up and and... 
They don't hear it. But yet, these folks, they really don't want anything bad to happen to Jesus. The Hebrew writer says, well, you hurt Jesus. You put him to an open shame. Let me cover the last two verses, and then uh, we'll have to stop. For the, for the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from it. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected, near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Verse 7 and 8 really talk about there's two, two types of people. And there's, first of all, those that receive the word, and then there's those that reject it. Those that study it, those that hear it, those that it says uh, bear herbs, those that uh, have their ground has been cultivated. It, does it remind you if you if you just casually read it and, and you kind of think about trying to associate something else in the Bible with it? Does uh, verse seven remind you of what? Parable of the sower. Yeah, it does me at least. It may not you, but it does me. And then verse eight. He talks about bears the thorns. Does that remind you of anything? Old Testament. What was what was the punishment of, of Adam? And so he says, if it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned, those who reject. And so... There's a thought here. There's an interesting thought. I, I'll put all this together when we finish this chapter next week. But uh, there are things that the Hebrew writer talks about really beginning, I think, in, say, verse 6, that are encouragements to grow. Well, the first thing is, is, is that uh, we need to grow to protect the feelings of Jesus, verse 6. Verse 7 and 8, we need to grow because of hell the fear of hell and what it can bring forth and what it does bring forth if we don't live the life we should. Okay, well, I've done a lot of preaching tonight. Didn't let you talk. Is there anything anybody would like to say, would like to ask or, or add? We're open to all questions. Can't say I'll answer them because I probably don't know the answer, but I'll try. If I don't, I'll tell you I don't know it. Well, we'll start right there then next week, Lord willing. We will start at verse 6. We'll move just a tad bit faster. We will probably get into the seventh chapter. And who is in the seventh chapter? Yeah, Melchizedek. And uh, everybody wants to know about Melchizedek, and I do too. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have something to say. But uh, we thank you. We hope that you have a fantastic week. I hope that uh, everything goes the way you want it to go. If you can come Saturday and, and help out, and that will be great. If you can't think of us, 